everybody. Um, as social action chair, I've been given the honor to introduce Jim Thompson. He developed the concept of climate change literacy and started the nonprofit, This Is What We Did, to combat the most dangerous threat in the history of humanity. Even though we have not met, I feel privileged to introduce John, Jim Thompson to you. Aside from his important work with climate change, Jim and his wife are founding board members of the Recovery Cafe in San Jose, which is a healing community for the homeless individuals traumatized by homelessness, mental illness, and drug abuse. Jim kicks off our Earth Day celebrations and honoring the planet in which we live. Jim? Linda and uh, Moshe, um, Rabbi Moshe, thank you. It's a real honor to be here. Let me um, pull up my slides here. The, um, I was talking to a venture capitalist uh, a while back and he asked me what I was doing and I said, started this new organization. Oh, what's it called? I said, it's called This Is What We Did. And he said, well, let me give you some free advice. Change the name of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I haven't changed the name. And it really revolves around what I call the ultimate question. Uh, what did you do to fight climate change? as the world collapses around us and our society collapses around us. And we want to be able to say, this is what we did. Um, and I want to talk about what I call the, the true superpower um, that we have. But I want to start with a poem. Emily Johnston is a valve turner. She risked arrest to break into um, an area in Minnesota where a pipeline was going through and she actually turned the valve to stop the flow of oil. And she was hoping to get her time in uh, court, but uh, the case was thrown out. And she's also a poet. So this is her poem, The Others Are Waiting. What could we have done differently once we understood? Let us not mince words, a great deal. How many millions of species then would not have disappeared? Those who felt paralyzed by how hopeless it was, they forgot about these ones, I think, like turning your head from a burning schoolhouse. There are many, no doubt, too deep inside to be saved. The others are waiting. Smash the windows. Jimmy the doors. So let me ask you, why? Why smash the windows? Why jimmy the doors? Is it really that bad? <clears throat> we have, um, the world we've known is gone. We just haven't realized it yet. Consider this, between 1970 and 2016, 68% of the animal life in this world disappeared. That does not count the more than a billion animals that were destroyed in the wildfires in Australia in 2019. We've had 9,600 wildfires last year, just in California. The uh, Texas-Mississippi freeze where people lost their power, lost their water. We are entering an era where we will be experiencing more and more devastating weather events that our system and our society is not prepared to protect us from. The permafrost contains more carbon than all the carbon that has been released in human history, and it's melting. Some scientists are now saying the most likely, likely outcome from the situation we're in is global collapse. Now, this is personal for me. I was chatting with uh, Rabbi Moshe Tom the other day. These are my grandchildren. That's Lila Sowell and Rafi Thompson-Ponette. <clears throat> um, my 
daughter-in-law is the daughter of a rabbi. So my grandchildren are, are Jews. And they are some of the most important things in the world to me. So this is personal for me. So some of you know who Greta Thunberg is, an 18-year-old Swedish woman. When she was at Davos, the economic summit, in fact, would somebody be willing to read aloud what Greta Thunberg said at Davos, the, the meeting of all the rich, powerful people in the world? Would somebody read that for us? Linda, you are muted. Thank you. I, I stopped my video. Sometimes I get the two mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> Adults keep saying, we owe it to the young people to give them hope. But I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day. And then I want you to act. I want you to act as you would in a crisis. I want you to act as if our house is on fire because it is. When I, when I um, stepped away from the CEO role of Positive Coaching Alliance, a nonprofit that I started 20 some years ago, I took a sabbatical and I started learning about climate change. I knew it was bad, but I had no concept of how bad it was and how quickly it is coming down the pike at us. The house is literally on fire. The question is, why isn't more being done? So I, I tried to put this as simply as I could. What is the problem, simply put? Well, first of all, the fossil fuel industry incurs no cost, pays no penalty. Unlike almost every other industry, it spews its waste materials into our atmosphere and pays no price for it. The rate of increase in global warming every day is the equivalent of exploding 400,000 Hiroshima bombs. The fossil fuel industry is not going to stop. There's just too much money at stake. We can't convince them to stop. We have to stop them. Government doesn't act because it's controlled by the fossil fuel industry. This is not a uh, a partisan political thing. There are many politicians in both parties who take money from the fossil fuel industry. People say government's not effective at solving problems, but government is very effective at solving the problems of the people who control it and own it. It's just, that's not us. And unless we neutralize the power of the fossil fuel industry, we're doomed. So going a little deeper, there are three flows of money. The first one is our money that goes to climate bad banks. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. There's then the flow of money from the banks to the fossil fuel industry. The fossil fuel industry cannot continue to destroy the world without financing from these banks. The third flow of money is fossil fuel industry money to our political system, our political leaders. We have to interrupt these flows of money or all the good ideas in the world won't see the light of day. There's a website, drawdown.org, that lists lots and lots of things that we could do to turn this thing around. But I'm gonna say that we're, we won't see the, those, uh, those solutions implemented without interrupting these flows of money. So, do you agree with that? That if we don't interrupt these flows of money, all these good ideas aren't going to see the light of day and we're going to be doomed. You agree? Disagree? I would love to um, just hear some folks. It, am, am I being extreme here? Do you, do you agree with that? Is there somebody who would like to address that? Ellen, I can't tell if you're raising your hand or... Oh, I'm uh, sorry. I'm uh, unmuting myself. <laughs> um, uh, I, I agree 100%. I, um, on uh, um, my email feed, I uh, 
um, subscribe to a number of newsletters uh, that make this point very effectively. The, the, there are investigative journalists who uh, do the research into what, you know, where the money is flowing. And um, it's, uh, it's without a doubt one of the single biggest factors in, in, um, in the predicament we find ourselves. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so, what do we do? I, I love the um, the um, the reading, the social justice reading, and I wrote down a few lines from it. Um, to do instead of just to pray, to become instead of merely to wish. When I started looking at what was happening with climate change, I realized I I had to act. I had to do Francis of Assisi, who's a Christian saint, died at the age of 42. Just before he died, he said, I am at peace because I have done what I have been given to do. I actually have right up here on my wall a little question for myself. What is it I have been given to do? And one of the things I've learned to do is to create nonprofit organizations and get people involved. So I want to focus this a little bit on banks. I think banks are really a key. The fossil fuel industry can't burn our world without financing, without insurance. The business model for the fossil fuel industry, 100% of it is getting oil out of the ground, selling it and burning it. But banks only have a portfolio of about 7.5% lending to the fossil fuel industry. They could stop this and still be profitable. The worst climate bad banks, and this is research done by the Rainforest Action Network, um, Chase, Wells Fargo, Citibank. Citibank is now number two worst over Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and Union Bank. <clears throat> and you can find this study uh, if you go to RAN.org, Rainforest Action Network, Banking on Climate Chaos. So if you look carefully here, uh, you might see some people that you recognize. Um, why do these people feel good about themselves? Anybody? Well, I'll just make that a rhetorical question. They're moving their money from climate bad banks. And if um, it's covered up in my side, I don't, I don't know if you can see uh, Rabbi Moshe on the right hand and, and uh, Dora, who is also, uh, I think, a member of this uh, congregation. We, we created a cohort model because our relationships with banks is sticky. It is, we have auto pays, auto deposits. Um, where do we, if we move out of Wells Fargo, where do we go? And people got stymied by that. So I, um, <laughs> I was, I realized I had to get my paycheck out of Wells Fargo. So I had to go online with Insperity, which is the human resources company that Positive Coaching Alliance works with. And I, I got my, figured out my, my uh, password and then it asked me two security questions. It said, um, where, um, where did you meet your wife? Where did you meet your spouse? And what, who is your favorite teacher? So I very confidently said St. Paul, Minnesota and Polly Ames. And they said, no, those are not the right answers. <laughs> now, that, that's the situation where I would have, I would have said, I don't have time for this. I'll come back to it later and I wouldn't have come back later. But the reason I stuck it out is because the week before to our cohort, I had said, I'm gonna do this by our meeting at noon on Friday and it was 10 o'clock Friday morning. So I stuck with it and I got it done. That's the kind of help that we give each other in these, these uh, cohorts. And then the other flow of money is the flow from the banks to the fossil fuel industry. And right now, the most important thing going on is line three, Enbridge line three in Minnesota. Uh, I went to school in Minnesota, grew up in North Dakota. Um, this this uh, line three crosses 200 water uh, 
water flows. It, uh, 15 million people rely on it for uh, those, those rivers, including the Mississippi, for fresh water. And it violates the treaty of the First Nation people there. Right now is the time to try to stop this. And um, there are emails, phone calls, calendar jams. It's one thing I really love is you can invite the, the CEO of Wells Fargo to a meeting and it goes to his calendar. And so hundreds of people are inviting uh, the CEOs of these companies to uh, join them. And of course they don't, but it, it provides a little bit of uh, friction for them. You can donate 300 people, more than 300 people have been arrested. Uh, they need money for uh, legal defenses. And then there are local demonstrations. There, there was one in San Francisco last Friday. There'll be another one coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, so what can we do to fight what I call the greatest threat in human history? And, the, and one answer is by ourselves, not that much. You know, we can get solar in our house if we can afford it. We can get electric vehicles if we can afford electric vehicles. We can become vegan or more vegan-ish, but by ourselves, not much happens. We have to call on what I call our true superpower. And um, I'm just gonna ask you if anybody would like to take a guess what our true superpower is. Coming no? together. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, we have a word for it. We call it solidarity. Solidarity is our superpower. The things that we do individually have almost no impact. When we do them together, they have great impact. So what can we do in solidarity to fight the greatest threat in human history? Well, one is become climate change leader. We have a quiz on our website. I like to say climate change is not fun, but our quiz is actually kind of fun. And you learn a lot about um, climate change. Move your money. You can do it by yourself, but as, as Rabbi Moshe has done, uh, he joined a cohort. I really would encourage you to, to join one of our cohorts and bring friends. It's really great when uh, two, two or three or more people do it together. Fight Line 3 in Minnesota, our newsletter, um, which you can sign up for, has all the places you can go to get. It's really easy to call or email uh, Chase Bank, for example. Um, there, there are systems set up to do that. And then we are we just finished our first effective climate conversations. This is a key skill. How do we talk to people about climate change without uh, people, uh, one person in our first climate conversations, he, his, he did his conversation with his daughter and his daughter said, you know, I have some friends who they're so into climate change. They're so intense. I don't even want to talk to them. I avoid them when they come. We, we don't want to do that. We want to be able to, to talk to people about what needs to be done in a way that will move them towards acting. No action is too small in solidarity. My wife designed this button and she said, no action is too small. And I said, well, actually there's lots of actions that are too small, but if we do them in solidarity, uh, they're not. So um, I really, um, value the time I spend with you. As I mentioned, um, the father of my daughter-in-law, Danielle, um, Jim Ponette, he was the, the rabbi at Yale. And uh, among the notable things he did was he married um, Chelsea Clinton, Hillary and Bill Clinton's daughter. Um, so, and Jewish people have been in the forefront of social justice campaigns forever. So it's really an honor for me to be with you. Please reach out to me, go to our website. If you would like to be part of what we're doing, uh, we would welcome you. Our mission is to uh, help build a movement that can break the power of the fossil fuel industry so we can save as much of this world for our children and grandchildren as possible. We do that through compelling educational experiences, a welcoming community, and easy access on-ramp to actions that you can do that will actually make a difference. Thank you.